All right, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Greg Roscoff, and I'm the owner and developer of, of Muscle Activation Techniques. I think we got a good group of, of people today, and thank you for coming and listening. Uh, today we're going to talk uh, about a unique look at, at spinal stability and, and the thought process behind uh, core stability and core training. And kind of a, kind of a unique look that, that comes from uh, years of experience, uh, which basically started and is kind of the, the experience and the, my own personal issues are what created or led me to create the principles and the process of MAT. And so, so first a little history because it goes specifically to what we're talking about today uh, when we're talking about the core and, and spinal stability is I had a fractured vertebrae when I was 19 and had a lot of residual issues. And I mean, by the time I was 25 years old, um, I literally, I mean, I had patellofemoral syndrome, plantar fasciitis, SI joint dysfunction. I literally had one injury after another. And I was 25 years old thinking, man, if I'm this bad at 25, what am I going to be like when I'm 50? And this all stemmed from the back injury. And I was playing football, I mean, up to that point, I played 17 years of football. Uh, I ended up having to sacrifice my, my last year of eligibility and went on and, and worked as a strength and conditioning coach at, at Fresno State. And in the process, I, I got my master's degree uh, with an emphasis in exercise science. So I was always dealing with the muscle system and exercise and, and muscle function. But, at this time, all, all from the, the strength and conditioning side of it. Um, and at, at that point, I can honestly say I had no idea between the relationship of muscle function and any sorts of pain. And so, I mean, when, when I was a strength coach at Fresno State, this is back in 85 when I got hired by, the, by Fresno State, and in 85, we literally, if someone was injured, they went to the training room. When they got healthy, they could come back to the weight room. So there was a disconnect between the athletic training side of it, the, the medical side of it, and the, and the strength and conditioning side of it. We weren't, we weren't um, supposed to be dealing with injuries. Again, this is 1985. A lot of, a lot of things have evolved since then, and, and we've literally, I mean, I think uh, uh, there's a more of a connection between sports medicine and sports training. And so in that, uh, I think, I mean, one of my things, because I had the fractured vertebrae, um, I, I wanted to find out answers. Uh, and so I sought out specialists across the country um, in all fields, the, from chiropractic to physical therapy to podiatry, um, massage, training, I mean, uh, exercise specialists. I sought out specialists in all fields to try and have a better understanding of, of muscle function and also try and figure out like, what's wrong with me. I mean, for selfish reasons, I, I was trying to learn from the top people out there and try and help myself. And so if I look back in the, the 25, 30 years of experience, um, I started out with individual uh, work. I worked with a physical therapist in, in Fresno, California, who uh, taught courses across the country on, on spinal mobilizations and SI joint uh, dysfunctions and, and how to address and correct them. Um, had a unique opportunity working and learning from this guy, Richard Jackson, um, and had a unique opportunity. And then I went on and, and sought out people like Gary Gray, who's been the, the king of function. Um, the, I mean, from a functional movement standpoint, and everything that's kind of transferred over the years into myofascial trains and, and integrated movement, um, had the opportunity early on to learn, learn principles from him. And then I was at one of the last courses that Vladimir Janda uh, taught. And uh, Vladimir Zhanda looked at postural imbalances. And uh, if you know of uh, uh, upper cross and lower cross syndromes and, and recognize him with a lower cross syndrome, that um, basically you have an anterior pelvic tilt and lumbar lordosis. And, and basically from a, from a protocol-based standpoint, it looked at with this anterior pelvic tilt, it's so common with people with low back pain, it's saying that the hip flexors and erectors are tight and the glutes and abdominals are weak. And, and so you need to stretch the tight muscles and, and 
strengthen um, the weak muscles. And I was going down all these roads and learned about orthotics and uh, and all the aspects of spinal neutral training and making sure you maintain that stable uh, spinal neutral position of the spine as you lift your legs and you lift your arms and um, doing bridging and and learning from all the top specialists out there. But I was still 25 years old in chronic pain. And that sent me down a, a continual path of trying to understand that what, one, why was I so bad? I was this bad at 25. What was I going to be like when I'm 50? Um, but again, it, it all started, I mean, from, from the back. I did the spinal neutral work. I did the stability ball. I would be exercises on the stability ball, stretching the hip flexors and erectors and, and strengthening the abdominals. And I was still in chronic pain. So that's what made me think, I mean, what, what is wrong with, the, uh, what was wrong with me? But is there something wrong with the system? And I would have clients that I would implement these principles with, and some of them would have success, and others didn't. And, and I had same, same responses that I had. And the one thing that I could always say is whenever I would stretch or get deep tissue massage, I couldn't get out of bed the next morning because I'd had numbness and sciatica down into my big toe. And I was like, so I mean, why are the things that I'm doing, understanding the biomechanics of movements and muscle function and how it related to pain, um, what was wrong with me and how come I wasn't seeing the results? And then as I started seeing other clients that weren't getting the results, I started focusing on the people that weren't getting better rather than all the people that were getting better with the principles. And I found out there was a missing link. As I looked at all of these practitioners, or looked at the, the foundational thought process behind all of these practitioners, the common denominator from every practitioner out there was that tightness is the cause of your pain. And after I had my fractured vertebrae, I got to the point where I could barely bend down to touch my knees, let alone my toes. And so I was chronically tight. So every person that evaluated me from physical therapy to chiropractic, to massage, to training, to exercise, the common denominator is we need to loosen up the tissues through chiropractic adjustments or mobilizations of the pelvic girdle or spinal segments or stretching techniques uh, to release and then processes to release scar tissue and adhesions. Uh, uh, everything was focused on loosening up the tight tissues. And the problem was I didn't respond to it. I responded negative. Like I said, whenever I would stretch or get deep tissue massage, I couldn't get out of bed the next day. So it made me look deeper into the muscle system's role in chronic pain and injury and what that all meant. So I'm going to follow a slide presentation to kind of lay this out of, of looking at it from a, uh, the core training and, and spinal stability uh, from, a, from a unique process. And so, so a unique look at spinal stability. So the first thing that I'm looking at as I'm as I'm working through the through the years and going through these processes is um, recognizing that muscles move bones and muscles hold bones in proper alignment, and that's that's an important factor because I, I, we can say structure dictates function, but the function of the muscles dictate whether or not the structure can move the way it's designed to move. But think about that as muscles move bones. And in 30 years of being in this industry, or 30 plus years of being in the industry from strength and conditioning to uh, working with muscle activation techniques and with clients on a day-to-day -day basis, um, chronic issue is dealing with low back pain. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. And core training, I mean, is the most focused area. If you go into any gym or rehabilitation center, I mean, any, any rehabilitation center, a physical therapy center, they're, they're basically setting people up with back pain. They're setting up on core training exercises or exercises to strengthen the muscles of the core. And the key is, is we have a, an epidemic in low back pain and abdominal, I actually say glutes and abdominals are probably the most focused area in the exercise and rehab industry. They're strengthening. And in my 30 years of working in MAT, the most common weaknesses from a neurological standpoint, which I'll make sense about as we move on, the most common weaknesses that I see are in the glutes and abdominals. So if our exercises are focused on trying to strengthen the abdominals, why are we seeing such an epidemic in glute and abdominal weaknesses? 
And that's something, what does that mean to us? What does abdominal weakness mean to us? We had a client literally uh, that came in and his core kept shutting down, if you want to say, which will make more sense of earlier. And he's like, I do 75 crunches three times a day. How can my core be weak? And it's like, it goes so much deeper than that. It's not about just making sure you're doing exercise. It's making sure you're, you're, you're accomplishing what you're trying to accomplish out of your exercise. And that's what we're going to, to talk about today is the most common area of weakness in the body, but it's probably the most focused area in the body. And so as we move through this, that's what led me to the development of muscle activation technique. I was literally in chronic pain. And literally one day I took a step back and <laughs> it's like, why, I mean, one, why am I so tight? Because tightness is a sign of weakness. And tightness is a sign of instability. If you think about it, just a simple analogy. When you walk on ice, what's the first thing you do when you walk on ice? You tighten up as a protective mechanism. So the natural neurological response is when the body senses instability, it will tighten up as a protective mechanism. Instability can be due to some external force with the, I mean, walking on ice where you have the instability due to, that, due to an external surface, or it can be an intrinsic mechanism. And that's what I started recognizing is that whenever you have stress, trauma, or overuse, which I had a fractured vertebrae, which was a traumatic event that led to chronic inflammation, the, the resultant inflammation alters the communication between the nervous system and the muscle system. The only way muscles can contract efficiently is if it's getting proper input from the central nervous system. There's electrical current, and muscles need to be able to fire and fire on demand. But when you have inflammation, that communication, those communication pathways get altered. So it's like having loose battery cables. It's like having loose, the muscles just don't fire and fire on demand the, the way they're supposed to. And when they can't fire and fire on the demand reflexively, they can't do their job to stabilize joints and protect you from injury. So that's a huge uh, uh, component here. It's an instability issue. When you have inflammation, you have instability. And the muscles are less efficient in their contractile ability, but the timing relationships are off. It takes more electrical input before the muscles can actually fully contract. Well, function's about timing. Muscles have to be able to contract and contract on demand, or you're not going to be able to, to protect yourself. And so inflammation negatively affects the ability for muscles to contract efficiently. Inflammation has a negative effect on, on slow twitch muscle fibers. So it, inflammation met, can, it creates a metabolic change in the slow twitch motor units, where slow twitch motor units become more fast twitch in nature. Basically, the main factors of that is the slow twitch muscle fibers, when they lose their oxidative capacity, so fatigability increases, but the threshold to activation gets higher. That's the loose battery cable analogy, is it requires more electrical current before you can get create a muscle contraction. So inflammation has a negative effect on input coming from the central nervous system to the muscle system. And that's the key to basically all of the problems that we have. So when you have loose battery cables due to inflammation and the muscles can't contract efficiently, when muscles can't contract efficiently, they can't shorten effect. But basically if my muscles are they're supposed to contract, my bicep contracts, um, it's going to fully shorten, contract into its shortened range. And the opposite muscles, due to reciprocal inhibition, when a muscle contracts, the antagonist muscle is going to relax. It has to allow the uh, bicep to contract through its full range of motion. So the opposite muscles end up relaxing and allowing for fluid motion to occur. But whenever you have stress, trauma, and overuse, the resultant inflammation alters the communication between the, the muscles that are trying to shorten, so those muscles can't shorten effectively, and the opposite muscles don't lengthen effectively. You lose the reciprocal inhibition to the antagonist muscle. So those antagonist muscles show up as being tight. So tightness is a sign of weakness. So when I told you I could barely bend down to touch my toes after I had the fractured vertebrae, it's because my, my body was weak. Tightness was a result of the weakness. And that's why every time we try and stretch or deep tissue work or release the tissues, 
we're violating the protective mechanism. And you think about it, if you gave some, if somebody's walking on ice and you gave them a muscle relaxer and you took away all their protective mechanisms, they'd stride out and then they'd end up slipping and falling and injure themselves. So when you violate the protective mechanisms, you can end up setting somebody up for potential problem. Anytime you have mobility without stability, you have vulnerability for injury. So the interesting component to this is muscles, you walk on ice and muscles tighten up. You see people as they get older and as they age and they become more and more dysfunctional. Um, they shorten their stride length and they start to tighten up and they re revert themselves toward their center of gravity. So they look like they're walking on ice. The natural neurological response is when the body senses instability, it tightens up as a protective mechanism. We revert ourselves toward our center of gravity as we become more and more unstable. Tightness is a sign of weakness. Now let's go to the little analogy. We revert ourselves toward our center of gravity. We revert ourselves toward neutral. Neutral is the position where we're the most stable. The extremes of range of motion are where our instability issues show up. Muscles can't contract efficiently. They can't shorten effectively, which means they can't tolerate forces in the extremes of range of motion. So we revert ourselves toward the center of gravity where we're the most stable. Neutral is the position where we revert to when we're dysfunctional. Neutral is the position that we train ourselves in when we're trying to train for core stability. We have to question that process. It's not saying it's right or wrong. It's saying we revert to the problem are we train ourselves in the position where we're, we revert to when we're dysfunctional? So it's the extremes of range of motion that are the positions where we're the most unstable. So you think about it, if somebody turns, oh man, when I turn to the right, my back hurts, or oh, when I bend over to touch my toes, my back hurts. We don't, people don't say, yes, oh, you know what, I, I injured my back when I did this. No, I injured my back when I bent over to pick up my child. I injured my back when I was swinging the golf club and torquing my spine to extremes of range of motion. Injuries occur when we put forces on the tissues where they're the most vulnerable. The first sign of muscle dysfunction is tightness. The second sign is pain. The second sign is pain with the body shouting out saying, quit doing this until you fix the problem. Pain shows up in the extremes of range of motion. So the first sign is, oh, I can't turn here. The second sign is, oh, when I keep forcing myself to turn in that range, it hurts. And that's why every time I would stretch, I would end up violating protective mechanism, and the body was shouting out saying, quit stretching, quit violating the protective mechanism until you fix the problem. Provide, provide a sense of stability, and the body will give you all the mobility in the world. So that gives us a paradigm shift in thought process from an exercise standpoint of what, how do we strengthen the core? And what would be the most appropriate process to, to, to strengthen the core? Because the extremes of range of motion are the positions where the body protects itself from moving into. So somehow we have to teach our body to be comfortable moving into those extremes of range of motion. So tightness is a form of protection and pain is the end result that you teach keep trying to violate those protective mechanisms or move into those ranges um, with this function. So basically, uh, muscle function actor exercise, just some research supporting what we're talking about. I mean, unaccustomed eccentric exercise, and eccentric is all variable. Every time our foot hits the ground, we have the muscles placed on a stretch, which creates the transformation from eccentric to concentric contraction. So we're always under eccentric load when we have gravitational forces being transferred through our body. And so the stretch, eccentric, unaccustomed eccentric exercise. So if the body's not prepared to tolerate the, the eccentric exercise, it results in the inability, due to the result in inflammation, it results in the inability for muscles to, to fully shorten, which means the opposite muscles are going to have an inability to fully lengthen. So the opposite muscles show up as being tight. And so the key factor that causes this is the resultant inflammation. 
We know that eccentric training causes an increase in, in delayed onset of muscle soreness. And so it's eccentric load placed on the muscle can, in, when the resultant inflammation alters the ability for muscles to contract efficiently, which causes protective tightening by antagonist muscle groups. So if we think about it just from an overall stability standpoint, uh, from a stability standpoint, we got so what structures support the spine? Many times we think of joints and we think of ligaments and we have all these passive structures that, that support the spine. And or even ACL and uh, different, I mean, ligaments that support the ankle joint. The first thing that we need to think, so if we look at the passive structures of the spine, you have the bones, I mean, obviously the vertebrae, uh, the ligaments that, I mean, attach the, the seg, that I mean, basically are designed to hold the segments in, in alignment with the discs in between and the articular curvature. We have all of these different passive structures that are basically, I mean, are what, what um, align our, our structure. But the interesting thing is muscles are what hold that structure in proper alignment. So if I had, if I, for whatever reason, if my muscles weren't able to contract, you take someone with paralysis, with a spinal cord injury that's not getting proper neural input uh, between the nervous system and the muscle system, when the muscles are paralyzed, the bones just are gonna collapse and fall. And I mean, all, now you only have the support, support from the passive structures. But if we take ligaments alone, Ligaments don't have the contractile ability to stabilize joints. Muscles do. The muscles have the contractile ability to stabilize joints. Muscles are what are holding us in upright posture. When I'm sitting here talking, or if you're sitting listening to me, it's the muscle contraction, the low grade, low grade muscle contractions that are allowing you to sit and watch this when maintain some form of upright posture. Muscles move bones, and muscles hold bones in proper alignment. Otherwise, our bones would fall into to a pile. And so they have the contractile ability to stabilize joints, so they're literally what we need to focus on when we're talking about disc injuries or facet irritation or any type of spinal, spinal malalignment. And so the muscles are what hold bones in proper alignment, and they're what move, move the bones. And so when we exercise, we have to think about that. Not only do we have to have muscles held or bones held in proper alignment, but we have to have them held in proper alignment through motion. And I think that's one of the keys that we miss in the exercise industry is that we revert back toward neutral, the position that we revert to when we're dysfunctional. We revert back to neutral to create stability in neutral, but we don't function in neutral. When I bend over to pick up my child or have them rotate my spine, I need to know that I have stability through motion. Not stability in one position, but I need to have stability through motion. So when we think of spinal stability, we have to think, is there stability through the independent spinal segments? So segment by segment, are each of the, the through muscle contraction and, and then the secondary ligamentous support, do we have stability through each of the individual segments of the spine? And then is there, I mean, global stability, is there stability through motion? Uh, as we move away from neutral. So as we move away from neutral, are those segments being stabilized uh, independently and integrated in an integrated fashion as we move through motion? And the biggest key which will dictate that is can muscles contract and can they contract on demand? When you have inflammation, it alters that timing relationship where muscles can't contract and contract on demand. Again, it's like having loose battery. So we need to know that we have tight battery cables. Through each of the muscles that attach to the segments of the spine and each of the muscles globally that move the thorax and pelvis around to create spinal motion, we need to know that each of those muscles can contract and contract on demand. And is there stability through motion? And one of the things that I'll say just from a stability standpoint, if you have somebody that's unstable, due to neuromuscular dysfunction or lack of I mean, loose battery cables, if they're unstable intrinsically because of the altered communication that results in an inflammatory, from an inflammatory response, if you add instability to instability, what do you get? You have more instability. So stability training, putting somebody on a ball to create stability or standing on a platform, an unstable surface, 
If you add instability to instability, you're going to get more instability. So the first thing we need to do with our clients is get them stable intrinsically, i.e. tighten battery cables, get the muscles so they can all fire on demand, then challenge them with unstable surfaces. So instability training should be part of the down the continuum of performance. It shouldn't be someone that's unstable, that can't barely walk or tolerate forces of everyday life. Those shouldn't be the people that we put on unstable surfaces. And we can say that, well, we've shown through research that it increases EMG activity. Uh, if you had somebody walking on ice, what would it do? Well, if you, if you measured EMG activity, what would you see? Anything and everything that can contract will contract. They're going to do anything and everything they can to try and keep themselves upright and stable. So increased EMG activity means that, yeah, we got to increase muscle recruitment because we're hanging on for dear life. And that doesn't mean that we're improving proprioception. It means that we're doing anything and everything we can to stay stable from due to the uh, due to the unstable surface. So we have to think of that. If we add instability to instability, put people on I mean, um, medicine balls or uh, with Bosu ball uh, or standing on unstable platforms, we may be challenging, overloading the system and challenge it, which causes it to tighten up and protect even more reverts us more toward our center of gravity and does nothing to teach us how to move through the extremes. So the, the key is thinking about it from an individual standpoint. One of the keys, Vladimir Jondo, and um, learning from him, you talk about these postural malalignments and like I said, uh, upper cross and low, lower cross syndrome, but he also broke it down to tonic and phasic muscles, which would be looked at as local and global stabilizers. Your local or tonic muscles are, are the muscles involved in segmental stability. So they're the ones that attach to each one of the segments of the spine. And when we think about that, the segments of each muscle that attach to the segment of the spine, it's designed to hold those segments in proper alignment, not just in a neutral position, but as you move through motion, the direct attachment to the spinal segments to hold the segments of the spine, spine stable. So those are considered our stabilizing muscles, our tonic muscles relative to, to, um, to uh, stability. And so they provide segmental stability and they help us with st provide stability when we're in the neutral position. So you think of that, we have the TVA with its attachments through the thoracolumbar fascia on the spine, the multifidus, the longissimus lumborum, the iliocostalis lumborum, quadratus and warm, these muscles attach to each of the individual segments of the spine, which would have the ability to maintain spinal stability. These are considered our stabilizing muscles. So when we think of maybe spinal neutral, maybe that's the idea. We're going to make these stabilizing muscles um, and increase their ability to contract to hold the segments of the spine in its neutral position. Consider these local muscles or these local stabilizers to be the hinges on a door. So these are the screws that screw in the hinges on the door. And if these muscles are all working properly, think of the screws being screwed in all the way. If they're, as long as they're all screwed in, now all of a sudden that door opens, there's, I mean, fluid motion, fluid motion about the axis and the hinges, and um, not, not a concern. So those are what the local stabilizers. So we want those hinges to be secure. We want those screws to be screwed in tight so that when somebody opens the door, that, that uh, those hinges are stable. Um, so the other side is, well, we got somebody opening the door. Well, who opens the door? Those are torque generators. Those are global stabilizers, which would be phasic muscles, are torque generators. These are the muscles that have the mechanical advantage to perform movement. These are the big muscles. These are the muscles due to the mechanical positioning. They have the mechanical advantage to perform motion because they're far away from the axis. So these muscles don't have segmental attachments. They have, I mean, they attach to the thorax, to the pelvis, and their, their, their origin and insertions are far away from the axis. So they can produce force. So these torque generators are basically the longissimus thoracus, the iliocostalis thoracus, the quadratus lumborum, costal fibers, which don't attach to the segment of each segment of the spine like the spinal fibers do, the rectus abdominis far away from the spine, the obliques, 
the pyramidalis, so your internal and external obliques and your pyramidalis, these muscles are all far away from the axis. You can see in the picture here the external obliques and internal oblique. I mean, they come from the rib cage to the ilium. I mean, they're so far away from the axis of rotation, which is the spine, that they can produce a lot of force. These are our torque generators. So our torque generators are the muscles, are they the muscles that um, far away from the axis and they, they produce the force to help us move. While our stabilizers, classified as stabilizers, are holding the segments of the spine in proper alignment as we move. Screwed in screws. We gotta make sure those screws are screwed in. So the key is, is that through Vladimir Zhanda's work and when you talk about local and global stabilizers, the conception was is the torque generators are predominantly fast twitch fibers. They're the, they're the ones that produce force. And the stabilizers are predominantly slow twitch fibers. And they're the ones that hold, I mean, provide segmental stability. And that, that's all true. But every muscle has to be able to contract and contract on demand. It's not about stability in neutral or in one position. It's about stability through motion. And if muscles can't contract and contract on demand, then they're going to be along for the ride. They're not going to be able to, once they initiate motion, they're not going to be able to, to provide stability. So every muscle in the body has a certain percentage of slow twitch muscle fibers. Even though the torque generators have a higher percentage of fast twitch fibers, they still have slow twitch muscle fibers. They're going to encompass a certain percentage of slow twitch muscle fibers which means that they still have muscles that have low threshold that for, to activation, which means they can contract and contract on demand. So that means they can generate forces immediately beyond our conscious control, reflexively. And that's the key to, fun, primary, or to functional movement. I said functions about timing. It's not just the stabilizing muscles that have to be able to contract on demand and hold the segments in position. It's the torque generators that have to initiate the motion and they have to be able to contract on demand. So let's put that in perspective. We have the torque generators, these big external obliques, and then the iliocostalis, the, all the big muscles that don't attach far away from the axis of motion, which would be the spine. These are the muscles that are moving us. If for whatever reason, due to stress, trauma, or overuse, the inflammation negatively affects the ability for the external obliques and the iliocostalis and longissimus to contract and contract on demand, the muscles that can contract on demand will contract on demand to try and produce the motion. So the torque generators are saying, I can't open them. Usually I'm the torque generator. I can freely open the door and use segmental muscles and just hold the hinges tight and it's fluid motion. Imagine if the torque generators became inhibited for whatever reason, were inflamed, and their timing was off, and they pick up slow, fast twitch characteristic where their threshold to activation is higher. The brain says, I gotta get from point A to point B. We don't have time to think about which muscles are working, the ones that will work, will work, or will move me, and the ones that won't are just along for the ride. So now you have the multipedis, or the, yeah, the multipedis and quadratus lumborum, spinal division, and all these segmental muscles that don't have the mechanical advantage to produce motion. These segmental muscles have to start trying to move us from point A to point B. And they're already overworked and overstressed because they don't have the mechanical advantage to perform that function. And again, when you have muscle weakness, you'll have correlating muscle tightness. So your ranges of motion will be limited and your mu muscle function will be very inhibited because the muscles that turn you and rotate you uh, that are far away from the axis can't turn you and rotate you. And so the range of motion will be the first sign of the dysfunction. Limitations in range of motion would be the first sign of the dysfunction. And then pain would be the second sign. The body shouting out saying, fix the problem. You're putting forces on my body and I don't have the right muscles working to get me from point A to point B. You keep overworking me. And so pain's an indicator something's wrong. So if your torque generators can't work, you're going to overload the segmental stabilizers. The muscles, are the, their only role should be holding the hinges in, in line, which means basically screwing the hinges in and keeping a, a stable axis to create motion off of. So then that's, that's what torque generators aren't working properly. But now you have your segmental muscles. The segmental muscles were the ones that attach right up the spine that we can call stabilizer. Well, stabilizer should have a low threshold to activation. 
they have a, a predominance to um, slow twitch motor muscle fibers and motor units, and a significant percentage of slow twitch to fast twitch is higher because that's their job. They're slow twitch uh, muscle fibers that should pr provide stability while the torque generators create the motion. But now these stabilizers get overworked. They get overstressed. And now they're inflamed. Well, inflammation alters the, the metabolic characteristics of the slow twitch motor units to make them more fast twitch in nature. So now all of a sudden, the threshold the activation of these muscles that are supposed to hold each segment of the spine in its proper alignment can no longer hold the segments of the spine in, in alignment. That's like somebody coming with a screwdriver and unscrewing each screw on the hinges about halfway. Torque generators are still doing their job, but the, these uh, torque generators are swinging the door open and these hinges are all rackety, like having loose lug nuts on your tire. Everything's just getting torn apart. The wheel wells getting torn apart on the car and the hinges are getting wrecked and all of a sudden that door flies off the hinges because you have instability of those muscles as through movement. You've lost stability through movement. When the door's shut, you're not going to recognize that you have weaknesses in the muscles that stabilize the spine. In a neutral position or resting position, I'm not going to recognize that I have dysfunction in the muscles that are segmentally supporting my spine. The minute I start moving, I bend over to pick up my child, or the door starts opening and the hinges are all rackety due to the screws being loose, i.e. muscle inhibition and the inability for those muscles to contract efficiently, once that happens, I mean, you got the you noticeable dysfunction. So it's dysfunction through movement. So what we need is to not hold the door shut. We need to hold, make sure that when the door is being opened and closed by the torque generators, that the segmental muscles that stabilize the each segment of the spine are actually able to contract and provide stability through motion. We need those screws tight. We need those muscles able to contract and contract on demand. Both the, the segmental muscles need to be able to contract on demand and the torque generators have to be able to contract on demand. If anyone, either side of, of those motions, the torque generators or, or the segment, segmental muscles are negatively affected by inflammation, you're going to have dysfunction. You're going to have resultant tightness and eventually pain. So the key is how do we take them? How do we take these principles Recognizing that where we, we have all these muscles, I mean, you got to look at all the muscles that control the spine, oh, rectus abdominis, I mean, no, the segmental muscles, um, the pyramidalis, the TVA, the internal, the external oblique, you got both lateral and, and anterior fibers, uh, you got quadratus lumborum, lumbarin, spinal, multipedis, iliocostalis, longissimus, spinalis, these muscles run up from the lumbar, lumborum, and thoracus muscles. You have all of these muscles that I call work to form a functional girdle. They form a girdle around the spine to keep the spine stable as we move. You have security. When all of these muscles are firing and fire on demand, you have the torque generators being able to do their job, the segmental muscles being able to, to do their job to stabilize each segment, and that allows for fluid motion and mobility. The minute you start losing that Girdle and muscles become weak. As it's like you have a girdle and you have all these strings that are strings that are cinched together. And all of a sudden the multipedis comes weak. Somebody comes and cuts one string. Then the iliocostalis is weak. And then the rectus abdominis. And each one with each one, all of a sudden you sacrifice the integrity of that functional girdle. And that's when the spine and the passive structures of the spine take the stress. That's when you have disc, bul bulging disc, herniated disc, um, degenerative joint disease over time. It's like driving your car with a bad alignment. I mean, think about the door when the door is open and closing with loose hinges. I mean, you're, you're creating you're got abnormal wear and tear on each of those segments. The discs are taking the stress. The um, reticular processes taking the, the stress. And I, I have degenerative joint disease. And when you have muscle weakness or muscle imbalances, and the torque gen, especially in the spine, and the torque generators and the stabilizer are not all contracting and contracting on demand. It's like driving your car with bad alignment. The harder and faster you drive it, the faster it's going to catch up with you. So it will catch up with you. So the goal is to say, how do we take this and say, how do we get away from neutral? 
Neutral is a position we revert to when we're dysfunctional. How do we expand so we can start moving through our extreme range of motion? So with spinal stability, so again, functions about timing, and you think go back back to that idea, just the basic principles. Uh, when the body senses instability, it will tighten the natural neurological responses, it will tighten up as a protective mechanism. Um, new spinal neutral training is nothing, that's not a bad thing. The position that we're the most stable is the neutral position. So the neutral position is a good place to start to try and create strength and stability. But we have to recognize that we need to be stable through motion. We can't just have segmental stabilizer working. We need those torque generators working. And the only way, if muscles can't contract efficiently, they can't shorten effectively. So think about the internal and external obliques who's responsible for rotating the spine. If my external oblique on one side, anterior fibers, and the internal oblique on the other side can't contract efficiently, it's going to say, ooh, I can't rotate. I can't turn and rotate because the muscles that move me into rotation are not contracting efficiently. When they can't contract efficiently, they can't shorten effectively. So you lose the ability to move to the ranges of motion that the structure dictates. Structure dictates function. The structure of the spine dictates that you should have significant amounts of motion in spinal rotation. The function of the muscles will dictate whether or not you can move through that range of motion. So unless there's degenerative changes, which are all a result of this process, that, this accumulation of bad alignment that you've had for years, unless there's degenerative changes, the structure dictates that you should have a certain amount of motion at each joint and each movement. The function of the muscles dictate whether or not you'll move through the ranges that the structure dictates you can move through. So when you think of, of spinal mechanics, I mean, muscles are designed to contract, they're designed to shorten, they're designed to move you. I mean, that's, I mean, function, that's what muscle function is all about is they're designed to move us and they're designed to withstand forces that are placed on from the external um, surfaces. Um, well, we have to understand that every muscle has a function. Every muscle in the body has a function. And there's main movements that we're able, that the structure dictates that we can move through. And then there's a muscle, there's muscles or groups of muscle that are associated um, with those movements. And those movements basically, oops, hold on, I'm gonna show you. Uh, look at those muscles of the rectus abdominis. Basically, every muscle in the body has its own set of battery gates. So every muscle or division of muscle, if we had the quadriceps, we'd look at the rectus, uh, yeah, rectus femoris, two divisions, the vastus medialis is actually three divisions, vastus lateralis, three divisions, the vastus intermedius, all of these, there's two divisions, all of these muscles or groups of muscles have their own set of battery cables. They have their own communication pathways with the central nervous system. So whenever we have stress, trauma, or overuse, the resultant inflammation can alter the communication between the nervous system and the muscle system. So it's like having loose battery cables. So you may find that certain muscles you have proper communication and other muscles you don't. So how would you be, if we look at the muscles of the core, the rectus abdominis and the muscles that move us, how would we be able to determine where there's altered communication pathways and what do we do when we have these altered communication pathways? I'm going backwards here as we go back into um, the rectus abdominis. What is the function of the abdominals? The function of the abdominals is mainly the rectus abdominis, which we just showed that each have their own set of battery cable, is to move us into spinal, spinal flexion. So in this position, this was a, a friend of mine worked on years ago. He came in, he was struggling with some back pain. And you look at the picture on the left and you'd say, you know, he's, I mean, he's got decent motion, but look at his feet are plantar flexed, his knees are, are slightly flexed, uh, his sacrum is actually at best perpendicular and it's all, I mean, basically there's a rounded spine and probably a posterior tilt of the sacrum. So relatively it's like, oh, I can touch my toes. We reward, we reward kids because they can touch their toes. It's like but relative to knowing his history and his general ranges of motion, he was tight. 
and he was tight, so his hamstrings and his back muscles were tight. So what's the conventional thought process? Stretch the hamstrings and stretch the lower back muscle. Tightness is a sign of weakness. So the tightness was because of weakness in his hip flexors and abdominals. The hip flexors and abdominals are the muscles that flex you toward your toes. So it's a paradigm shift in process. Whenever you see a limitation in range of motion, it tells me that one or more of the muscles that move you in that position are potentially weak. So through the process of MAT, which is much more in depth, um, and there's a lot of information out there that you, you can access. And I think through um, our administrator, they actually put a link if you want to access more information uh, on, on MAT to learn the foundational principles. There's a lot of information out there. But from a general standpoint, a general principle to learn in this quick uh, webinar is if he can't move his toes, it means the muscles that move him there aren't contracting efficiently. So the hamstrings and erector spinae muscles have tightened up. So the first thing we did was we tested and treated every muscle that crossed the axis into hip flexion and spinal flexion. That reactiva reactivated those muscles, and then you see the picture on the right. He increased like five inches in motion. But look at his toes are no longer plantar flex, his knees are long, no longer plant. His sacrum is actually anterior tilted. So, and he's got more of a rounding of the spine. By increasing the activation of the anterior muscles, it took away the tension on the posterior muscles. We melted the ice. So the goal, when you have muscle tightness, is identify where the problem is. And the best tool, I always tell our practitioners with MAT, the greatest tool that we can have as an MAT practitioner is the ability to assess range of motion. Because I always say, I don't care what you can do, I want to know what you can't do. Because what you can't do is breaking you down. If you can't bend to touch your toes, then the muscles that move you there are unstable, which means they can't do their job to protect, to protect you from injury, to stabilize joints and protect you from injury. So any place you see a limitation in range of motion is telling you there's an instability issue related to the muscles that move you into that position. Instability is not a good thing. And the natural neurological response is when the body senses instability, it tightens up as a protective mechanism. So the range of motion exam is the most important tool that we can have as trainers, therapists, um, any type of medical practitioner. The range of motion exam is the greatest tool you can have. Like, oh, I can't rotate my arm back. Oh, this one I can. Ooh, that actually hurts when I rotate because pain is the first sign of muscle dysfunction is tightness. The second sign is pain. And when somebody can't move in that position, we don't want to force him in the position. If I stretch his hamstrings and erect your spine eye and he can reach four inches past his toes, that means I've opened up a range that's unstable. I didn't melt the ice. So that's why people stretch day after day after day. And at the moment, they see greater ranges of flexibility, but they come back the next day and they're just as tight as they were the day before is because we haven't melted the ice. The goal is, is to melt the ice. So if we're looking at spinal mechanics and we're looking at movements, muscles move bones and muscles hold bones in proper alignment. Every muscle has a certain percentage of slow twitch fibers and every and relative to fast twitch but it's the slow twitch fibers that are the ones that allow us to contract and contract on demand. Those are the fibers that are negatively impacted by inflammation. Those are the fibers that we need to focus on. And we talk, on, uh, talk about the rectus and the functional girdle um, <laughs> and jumping across an hour, it's a hard time to get into um, all of the information in an hour period, but I did say I mean, range of motion becomes the indicator. Now let's talk about spinal mechanics. Range of motion is the key. Where can the spine move? If we had to look at four main movements of the spine, I already talked about rotation. You'll see in, in the golf world, as Bryson DeChambeau uh, has come through the, the whole MAT process and we've strengthened his abdominal muscles through every one of these motions to a point where he's the longest driver on the tour. And he's more, his in, as he's increased his strength, his flexibility has dramatically increased. Because the first goal was to tighten battery cables. The first goal was we had to tighten the battery cables to improve the neurological control, which started to open up motion as the muscles were able to contract more efficiently. 
then we were able to strengthen the muscle. So the goal is if you have a dead battery on your car, you can turn the key to the ignition all you want. But until you, you jumpstart the battery, the car is not going to start. So the same way, we have to do the same thing when we're thinking about retraining the core, retraining abdominal muscles to teach the body how to move. We want to start from neutral, but teach the body how to expand through its ranges of motion. Those main ranges of motion in the spine and in the spine are spinal rotation. I should be able to turn equally symmetrically to my left side and to my right side. The next movement is spinal side bend. I should be able to side bend equally from my left side to my right side. I should have symmetrical motion. The last set, next one is spinal flexion. I should be able to reach to my right toe as, the, as symmetrical as I reach to my left. Because if I'm reaching to the right, I got my, or my left foot, my right abdominal, rectus abdominal muscles are working more. Go to the right toe, my left rectus abdominis are in the side. So I have, to, I have to have symmetrical motion. Range of motion is your most important key. When I go into spinal extension, I should be able to slightly rotate and extend as easy to the right and to the left. Those are the four main motions that make up spinal movement. The structure dictates that you should have significant amounts of motion in each of these movements. Less than side bend uh, and extension compared to flexion and rotation but the structure dictates the motion that's available. Wherever you see a limitation in range of motion, it's telling you that the muscles that move you there can't contract efficiently to move you there. The last thing we wanna do is start loading you through great ranges of motion. And trying, when the body's saying, I'm unstable here and I'm tightening up to protect from going here. So the first thing we wanna do is jumpstart the batteries re-establish communication between the nervous system and the muscle system. So think about any motion, any motion that you move through. We're going to go with spinal rotation. Cross your hands right over your shoulder. And I'm going to have them turn all the way to the right and then turn all the way to the left. One direction feel easier than the other. Right. He tightens, he's, he's, it's easier to go to the right than the left. Okay, so it's easier for him to go to the right than it is to the left. So that means without knowing, having to worry about every muscle that crosses the axis and which, which ones have a neurological deficit. So he's saying he's limited in motion going to the left. So we need to jumpstart. We need to reestablish the communication between the nervous system and the muscle system through isometric, low intensity isometric contraction. So low intensity, long duration, longer duration isometric contraction we can recruit those slow twitch motor units. So in this position, he goes into the shortened position, his right obliques and left, right external, left internal, along with other muscles are all creating this spinal rotation. We're going to have him do an isometric contraction, low intensity, about literally about 2% intensity, pushing into my hand to further move into the shortened position of spinal rotation. And he holds that for six seconds. Then he relaxes. Then he rotates his body back in and rotate, rotate back. And then he does another contraction for six seconds. And he comes out. Then he goes back in. And as you notice, his rotation is increasing with each contraction because we're reestablishing the communication between the nervous system and the muscle system to the muscles that create left rotation. And his range of motion is increasing. So this is jump starting. This is tightening the battery cable. So now if I come back, cross the arm, turn all the way this way, then turn all the way the other way. That's a little easier. Yep. So now we can rotate more. I didn't see you like that. I didn't stretch him. I actually reestablished the communication. We asked the muscles. When muscles can't contract efficiently, they can't shorten effect. So all I did is reestablish the communication between the nervous system and the muscle system to create the ability to, for those muscles that move you into the extreme of range of motion and left rotation to fully shorten. When they can fully shorten, it's like melt through reciprocal inhibition. It's like melting the ice. Now I've melted the ice because now the muscles can contract efficiently, the tightness goes away. The tightness is a sign of weakness. 
So instead of stretching him and saying, oh, we need to increase your left rotation, so I'm going to stretch you into left rotation, we're saying, no, I'm going to teach your muscles how to move you there. Once you jumpstart the muscle, now you can strengthen it. Now you can drive your car. After you jumpstart the battery, you can drive your car. Now start strengthening it through concentric eccentric, a, a low progression, concentric eccentric exercise, and say, I'm going to teach the muscle those trunk rotation movements, uh, machines out there, you can do medicine ball work, you can uh, do, but we have to teach the body now how to follow up and strengthen the muscles through their full range of motion. You can start from neutral and work away. When people say, and, and the other key is pain's an indicator something's wrong. So even if they can move further and they say that uh, I still have pain and I turn all the way to the left, don't, I mean, there's a 15 degree carryover and isometric strength. And so you could actually take them 15 degrees out of that range of motion and have them do isometric contractions, and you'll start getting a carryover in isometric strength to greater ranges of motion. And so the key is to start with isometrics in any position. Sit up. If he's reaching to the right or to his left foot, and he can't he can't reach to the left foot as well as he can lift the, reach to the right, we pull him in the position, go to the left foot. And then we just have him do an isometric contraction, pushing into spinal flexion. This is spinal flexion, taking him into that position, relax. Then come forward again, take him out, six contractions, six second holds. He pushes into my hand. We're activating the rectus abdominis muscles that flex the spine. Relax. And then come forward again. And each time, look at that, his range of motion is improving. Isometric contractions further into the shortened range. Not contract, relax to the antagonist muscle. We'll do one more. Look at he's touching his toes now. And relax. And then say, okay, let's see you touch your toes again. Look at that. He's got greater range of motion than he did. He increased like five degrees, 10 degrees of range of motion. Range of motion is the biggest key. Wherever you see a limitation in range of motion, especially in ACE, Symmetry in motion, if they can turn 45 degrees to the left, but they can only turn 20 degrees to the right, there's a dysfunction in the muscle that rotates you to the right, and you have to reactivate those muscles. Then you follow it up with strength. So lie back. If I have him do a spinal neutral exercise, and he maintains a neutral position and lifts his arm and lifts his leg, what have I done to teach his rectus abdominis to flex him forward? If I do a, rota a spinal neutral exercise to... Um, to cross rotations with the leg and opposite arm, or I'm doing these isometric holds where the force is pulling, what have I done to teach those muscles to move through various extremes of range of motion? When you have muscle inhibition due to muscle weakness, the weaknesses show up in the extremes of range of motion. We're the most vulnerable and the most dysfunctional in the extremes of range of motion. We have to teach our body how to move to the extremes. And then we have to strengthen the muscles through full ranges of motion in order to maintain stability throughout the ranges. The door, the hinges, and the torque generator, the door opener, all have to be working at a high level. They all have to be able to contract and contract on demand. So again, I said, I don't care what you can do. I care what you can't do. Because what you can't do is breaking you down. If you can't move in the right side, there's a dis muscle dysfunction there. If you can't move into rotation in one direction, there's muscle dysfunction there. If you can't move into spinal extension in one, with slight rotation in one direction, there's muscle dysfunction. Tightness is a sign of weakness. If you want to start a true core stabilizing program, we have to think stability through motion. Stability through motion. We need muscles to be able to track and move the structure through the ranges that the structure dictates it can move through. This is a short lecture, I'm trying to produce, throw a lot of information in a, in a short session, but uh, like I said, there's more information. I think there was a link to on the go-to webinar if you want to find more about the process and the education processes, but these principles stand true throughout the body. But the core is where everything starts. I mean, that basically, we learn to roll over, we learn to sit up, and then we learn to crawl. I mean, the muscles of the abdominal wall are where we start to live in our motor, move, creating our motor patterns as we learn to ambulate. Everything starts from the core and works out. So core training is a key. And we have to teach our body to move. Kids don't stay in neutral. They learn to move. 
And we need to keep those processes going because if you don't use it, you lose it. And over time, people lose the ability to move. And that's why people are doing core training on a daily, daily basis in gyms, and we still have an epidemic of low back pain because the core is the most dysfunctional area that I see on a clientele from a day-to-day -day basis over the last 30 years. So just a different viewpoint of looking at the core and how to keep it stable and how to make it strong. Thank you all for attending. I appreciate you um, spent taking the time and hopefully we'll see you again. Thank you.